suit that they had custom made for me in India while I was there as a gift. They tricked me. Now, they did this for me in 2013, but this time they tricked me. They said, uh, Pastor, if you don't mind, I know you want to get back to the hotel, but uh, I need to stop at the shop and get a shirt made. Yeah. Said, Whatever you want. <laughs> and, of course, they got me in there and, and uh, to the fabric shop. <laughs> and they said, now pick you out one. We're going to have a suit made for yeah. you. Yeah. And so it took me about 30 seconds to pick out this fabric. Mm -hmm. Isn't it nice? Yeah. And then this yeah. lining. And then what you do is you, you, it's an adventure. Mm -hmm. This street's about this wide. To get where the tailor is. So you got your fabric now. The shirt too. And I've never had a shirt. They made this shirt in like less than 48 hours. Wow. It was on a fabric roll when I picked it out. And uh, But anyway, you got to go in there. Dodge all the dogs and the buffalo and everything else that are in the street. It's just wildness. Anyway. But to get there. And then they you know, do your measurements. And 48. But this is it. Reverend Kamala, if you're, I don't know if you're watching. Praise God. But... Uh, what an honorable thing. I wanted to wear it tonight. Amen. Turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 11. Well, you all have had a, either had a bad day. I mean, when you hear Mark 11 and you don't jump out of your seat and run around, then I know you hadn't got it yet. So, Miss Amber, the next time the Lord leads you to Mark 11, don't have a second thought about going there. We'll know you've begun to get it when you hear Mark 11 go, Oh, glory to God! Hallelujah! Really? Mark 11? <laughs> Hallelujah! Praise God. You know, Brother Hagin said, he said, you know when the Word of God will begin to work for you? He said, when you get excited about it. You take a blasé, laissez-faire uh, attitude towards the Word, Remember, Jesus said the way you hear, not just what you hear. He said, take heed to how you hear. It's going to matter. It's going to determine the measure of power and revelation that comes back to you. Let's all close our Bible. Close, our, close it up. Close it up. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 11. Oh, see, praise God. Now, come on. Listen, that makes Jesus happy right there. Come on now. <laughs> this is His Word we're talking about. Come on. Hallelujah. You know, people, believers don't need a man of God to fly 8,668 miles to get blind eyes open. You could take Mark 11 or a number of scriptures and have the Lord receive your miracle directly by faith. We, this is just a holy, holy book, powerful book. Looking at verse 24, Jesus said, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall receive them. If you recall in, uh, I know, thank you Brett also for ministering last week, he did a wonderful job talking about fighting. Getting out there fighting, having a chip on your shoulder. Yeah, amen. And uh, fighting the good fight of faith. But in my services, uh, this will be the third one in a row, we're talking about seven steps to answered prayer. Now, we're not talking about just prayer in general. We're talking about a very specific kind of prayer that we call the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith is going to be the prayer that you pray primarily to receive what you want, what you need from God for yourself or for maybe an immediate family member. Amen? Now, of course, oftentimes God will allow a baby Christian to be carried on another person's faith, just like we carry natural infants because they can't help for themselves. They can't do for themselves, right? right. God knows that that baby Christian, if, some, if the devil attacks them, and he often does in, in their newfound walk with God, God will allow someone else to use their faith. That's why if you've ever experienced, it was, you know, maybe you've been a Christian for a long time now, and you say, you know, in my early days, it was just, I was getting prophecies all the time. I was getting called out of services. Uh, uh, I just, you know, it'd be so easy to get healed, and now it's hard to get healed. Or now I don't get healed. Well, see, you were in the babyhood stage of Christianity. And God's just you know, dismissing a lot of doubt and unbelief and unskillfulness and lack of knowledge because you hadn't been around and someone else prayed for you and bam, you got it. 
But see, God expects us, believer. Are you listening to me tonight? God expects us to leave the babyhood stage of Christianity. Now, we don't have to worry about it physically. If we get the right amount of nourishment, our body's going to advance and grow and develop, at whether we like it or not. Some of you, I know you could wish you could still suck your thumb and have somebody feed you and all of that. But you're going to grow and develop. But listen, leaving the babyhood stage of Christianity is not automatic just because you've been a believer. Time has nothing to do with it. You could be a child of God for 30 years and still be wearing diapers spiritually. It is up to you to decide, I am going to leave the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ and that I'm going to grow up in the things of God. Now this is vitally important, let me tell you, because God, just like parents expect as the child grows, we expect the child eventually... Mom and dad, they put that child on the ground and expect them to walk because now they're capable. Right? And as they grow, more and more personal responsibility is added to that young person because they're capable. And putting that responsibility on them is not a burdensome thing, it's a loving thing because we're nurturing them towards maturity and independence and full development. Amen. Eventually, God is not going to answer the prayer of faith of somebody else to get you healed. Or to get your money. Or for you to walk in divine protection. Or for you to, for you to receive guidance from the Holy Spirit. Eventually, He's going to expect you to be able to receive that from, for yourself. And if you've neglected your spiritual development, He says, I'm sorry, sweetie, you're either going to come to heaven early or you're going to figure it out. Because... Uh, Pastor Chris is not going to be able to get it for you this time. Are you with me? So it's vitally important that we are earnestly coming to the school of faith, the local church, amen, and learning how to develop your faith for yourself. And so we're talking about seven steps to answered prayer. Let me scroll down and uh, let me remember, uh, make sure that you remember, I believe we've covered four of those seven steps. Number one was decide what you want from God. Decide definitely what you want from God and then find scriptures. Find scriptures that promise you what you're wanting God to do for you. Listen, if you cannot find scriptures, you should not be asking God for it anyway. It's like Brother Hagin had someone come up to him. He was standing there uh, with a host pastor having a conversation after a meeting. And a brother comes up and says, "Uh, would you guys pray the prayer of agreement with me? He said, well, what about? He said, well, and he's married, but he said, I've set my heart and I believe God wants to give me so-and-so's wife. Could you imagine coming up to a pastor? You've seen it? Coming up to a pastor and... And, and, and let them know that you're committing adultery, spiritual adultery, lusting after another man's wife, coveting after another man's wife, and wanting that man of God. You actually believe that God was going to cause two divorces, break up families to get... The... It's in the realm of the sublime, isn't it? Ridiculous. But you'd be amazed what people think. Listen, get into the Word and find out what belongs to you. Before you go to praying. Because it's the Word of God and only the Word of God, not a dream, not a vision, not a feeling, not some sort of spiritual experience. Find the written promise in the Word. Two of them. Amen. Amen. That's going to give you a sure foundation for faith. I always feel better about things when I have it in writing. I don't know about you. And God has done us the kind privilege of putting it in writing, and ratifying it in blood. Amen. Notice verse uh, 24 here again. He said, whatever you desire. Right? Now listen, you cannot take, as Brett said, this whole uh, idea of whatever will be, will be with God. What did Jesus say? Whatever you desire. Whatever you desire. Amen. When you pray. Now, just because you, that desire is step number one, you've got to have that. Decide what you want from God. Right? But then you must have those promises in you to the degree, like Miss Amber was saying before she started speaking to Mango, the dog, about being 
healed, she had to get, she knew that scripture was there, but she's feeding on that. She's feeding on that truth. Faith comes how? By hearing. And, med- and then all of a sudden light came and it dawned on her and now she can move out in faith. See, do you see how many times prayers go unanswered because you actually prayed too soon? Don't skip any of these steps. Amen. Step number two is ask the Father in the name of Jesus for that thing. Amen. And very critical, believe you receive it at the time that you pray it. Listen, if you don't really in your spirit believe that what you asked God for was granted from heaven, that it became yours that moment, then you've not, no need to go to step three, no need to go on. You just better stay right there and and meditate and have God help you. Because unless you believe you receive your healing, for for instance, that it, it is now yours right then, apart from seeing, apart from feeling, a part, of, uh, a, a part of any confirmation from the doctor, healing became yours right then. I like how one minister put it. He says, let me help you uh, understand what it means to believe you receive. It means to believe in the area of healing, you believe that the death blow was struck to that disease at the moment you believed you received your healing. The, you know, the power that was advancing that pain or that sickness that a supernatural death blow was struck at the moment you said, I believe, I take hold of my healing, I receive it now. You, what you must believe is that a death blow was struck. Whether evidence shows up in the natural right then or next week or next month or whenever, that's not up to you. You understand? But to pray the prayer of faith based on nothing else but God's promise, His Word, amen, you believe, you believe that thing becomes yours. I have the money. Just as if I called up the banker and he confirmed the money was in my account. I have it. Now, that doesn't mean you, spend the, you write a hot check. That's not faith. But you believe it became yours. Are you with me? Well, now you've gotten to where I say the amen, and you're moving into a, when you get to step three, you're moving into a whole other phase of the prayer of faith called the standing phase. And this is where many uh, miracles uh, are aborted. Many answered prayers are aborted in the standing phase. Now you realize that there's going to be a space of time, most of the time, between you saying amen and there it is. And what you do in that space of time between amen and there, you understand what I mean by there it is? It showed up in the natural realm. There it is. How many of you believe you're sitting in a purple chair tonight? No, you don't. None of you do. None of you do. You know you are. Faith is for what you don't see. Faith is what you do when you don't feel. I don't believe that I have $100 in my pocket. I know I do. Faith ends when the thing shows up in the natural realm. You don't need faith to believe there's a wood table here. I can see it. I can feel it. I can grab it. It's there. I know it is. Listen, faith, a lot of people don't even enter into faith. They refuse to enter faith until they can see it or touch it or feel it. You'll never get there. Faith is what you have and faith is what you do when you do not see, when you do not feel from the net when you cannot hear when there's no physical evidence that is when you're in faith faith ends when the doctor tells you well it's all gone that's not when faith begins that's the consummation of faith that's faith the bible says hebrews 11 uh, 1 that uh, now faith is the substance of things hoped for see i have a property for sale and right now i'm in faith about it i am in faith about it Amen. Amen. When the contract signed, the money changes hands. I won't be in faith. Will end at that moment, right? Right, right now, what my what my faith, what our my family and I, what our faith is doing, our faith is giving substance to that thing we expect. Hope means expectation. You following me? So, in steps three, four, and five, uh, you know, the rest of the steps here, three through seven, 
It is about how to help you get through the standing phase so that you don't abort your miracle, that you don't cancel your prayer. So step number two, if you recall, now you've believed you received it, and you walk away, and in the natural, nothing's changed. You don't feel any different. It's not like the pile of money showed up instantly. <laughs> not like the body changed instantly. A lot sometimes it does, like those eyes open, and bam, there it is. But I'm expecting, we laid hands on a precious young lady that was scheduled to have surgery because of blood clots in her brain. Well, I curse those. Come on, I, we curse those. Those things are dead and dying. The death blow's been struck. Yeah. And I, I hope that the Lord allows me to get word back from 9,000 miles away that that girl didn't have to have surgery. Yeah. See, whether it's instantaneous, whether it's gradual, makes no difference to faith, makes no difference to me. The death blow's been struck, and that thing can't go any further. Amen. So step number three, if you remember, was be positive in your thinking. Be relentlessly positive in your thinking. So many people, it's not that God uh, said no, but in the in-between, between amen and there it is, they got negative in their thinking. Well, a week's, a week's went by. You know, and they start judging things by the natural. And then the enemy starts whispering suggestions of fear and worry and doubt in their mind. And then you get around other people who are experts in unanswered prayer. And they don't help you either. And it's very easy to begin to get discouraged and faint and negative in your mind. Now why is that dangerous? Faith is of the spirit, not the mind. Well, because so much of the time what's on your mind eventually comes out of your mouth. And when what's on your mind comes out of your mouth that's contrary to what you said you prayed and believed you received... You just erased it. You just took a mad, you just canceled out. You hit the delete button, and heaven stops right then because you're the one in authority down there. God does not move on our behalf because we need Him to. You understand that? You, would, you might think He would, but He's just, God's a faith God. He doesn't move on, on your, He's not more likely to move because your situation gets desperate. Because in his mind, faith is the victory that overcomes the world, and I've already given it to you. It's not like he's moved by it. Listen, if God was moved by desperate need, there wouldn't be any hunger. There wouldn't be any children with, you know, those bellies and the, the you know, there wouldn't be any of that going on. If God was moved, there wouldn't be any unpaid bills. We, all we really had to do was just wait until things got desperate, and then God, out of His move to help us out of our desperation, would just fix it for us. And that's not how He works. God's a faith God. You know, some people are in desperate need to get saved. They don't know that one week from now they're going to die in a car wreck and go to hell. They're in desperate need. Every second of every day, the, the unbelieving one is closer to blowing hell wide open. How come God doesn't do something more spectacular to save them? He's already paid the price. He's already sent Jesus. The church is already in the earth. The, messages is, the message of the gospel is being heralded all over the world. It's up to them to believe and receive. And if they don't, God will let them go right to hell. Are you with me? Hallelujah. You've got to be positive in your thinking. You cannot allow an image to form in your mind that is contrary to what you said you believed. And what you said you believe became yours right then. So step number four was very similar, and I want to talk about it a little bit more. Uh, praise God. And that was guard your mind. Very similar to step three, but you must guard your mind. Amen. I mean, when you're under pressure, I tell you what, it's important that you guard your mind. Listen, Satan has lost. Demons, they don't have access to your born-again spirit because the Holy Spirit's in there. He's not shacking up with the devil. The only, and, and the enemy cannot keep your answer, prayed in faith, from coming to pass without your involvement and your cooperation. He can't use his power apart from you and stop that thing from coming to pass. If you stay in faith, it's going gonna, it's gonna to manifest. Faith works every time. Faith is a law. You understand that? Faith is a law. 
Let, let me stop and give you an illustration of how this works. You remember uh, Jesus came up in the middle of the night on his disciples walking on the water? That's kind of miraculous. You know, it's not a typical thing that happens. He's walking on the water. And they were scared out of their gourd, thought it was a ghost. You would too, probably. I probably would have too. Jesus said, fear not. It is I, be not afraid. And Peter, you know, he's always first. Good or bad, he's always first. And he's first to speak up and say, Master, if it's you, if it really be you, bid me or invite me to come join you on the water. Well, he sure put Jesus in a box. It'd be, be, you go to hell for lying. And it really was him, so what's he going to say? Come, it's me. So he said, come. And you know what Peter did? He stepped out of the boat, and he began to walk on water. Now listen, a miracle has begun for Peter. You, you, the pow- he's moved in faith, and the power of God is honoring his faith, and he's beginning, and he, it says he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Did Satan let that go unopposed? Of course not. You know what he did? Immediately he caused the wind and the waves to come up. And it says in there, it says, when Peter saw the wind boisterous. Notice that. When Peter saw something natural that was contrary to the word come, he became fearful when he got his attention off Jesus and onto the boisterous water. What does wavy water have to do with whether or not you can walk on the water or not? Is it easier to walk on the water if the water is smooth or wavy? Nothing. But here's what I want you to see. That miracle was not fully consummated. In one sense, that miracle was aborted. Not because Jesus said, you know what? I've decided not to let you. Not because God ran out of power. Peter left the faith arena. Notice, just like you could say amen and you've released your faith and now you're in faith. Can you leave the faith arena an hour later? A day later? And do just what Peter did. Let's not pick on Peter, we've all done it. And he did walk on water (laughs) for a little bit. I'm certainly not criticizing him. But what I want you to see is, is that because he got his eye off the word... He became negative. He didn't guard his mind from opposing contradictory evidence. Where did that contradictory evidence come from? The natural. Mm -hmm. Satan was effective in getting him out of faith, robbing him of his answered prayer, robbing him of his miracle. And how did he do it? Through making Peter see something and feel something that was unpleasant from the natural realm. I want to make sure you're all with me. You all with me in this section on that principle? Faith is of the spirit realm, and faith has everything to do with the Word of God. And when your mind is fixed on the Word of God, and your heart is fixed on the Word of God, you can walk on the water of disease, you can walk on the water of unpaid bills, you can walk on the water of depression, oppression, fear, whatever it is, walk right on to glory land. But Satan's not going to let you do that without getting in the ring with you. So what he's going to do is he's going to stir up circumstances. He wants you to get your eye off that promise, off off of Jesus, onto that thing, and then go, oh my God, and become fearful. And it's like reaching over to a plug and unplugging it from the power. Are you getting that? This is why we must guard our mind. Go over to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. You all all right tonight? Hallelujah. Thank God for business class. I feel good. (laughs) Thank God for those Englishmen. Sir, can I get you anything? Hallelujah. Thank God for prosperity. James chapter 1. Now, notice verse number 5. If any of you lack, and then there's the word wisdom. Now think about this. You could, now here he's talking about wisdom, but you could put a blank there. And put, and just think about any promise of God. If if you lack finances, 
If you lack peace, if you lack healing, if you lack wisdom, what does he say to do? Ask. Right? Come on. That's what he said. Do you see the steps? If any of you, you have a need, okay, now ask of God that gives to all men liberally, mean, meaning generously, and he upbraideth not. It's not like you're putting him in a bad mood because you're asking him for something. And it shall be given him. But, hello, but let him ask in faith. Let him ask in faith, comma, nothing wavering. Do you see in that illustration how Peter wavered? And aborted his answer, aborted his miracle? Could you think back and you just know in your history, I've done that. I asked, I asked in faith, but then I wavered. I got under pressure and I wavered. I got to looking at those bills and I wavered. I went to the doctor and got a report I wasn't expecting and I wavered. Hello. God, God is fair. He's straight up. Nobody should be under any illusion about what's going to happen if we waver. So nothing wavering, for he or she that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Now a wave is not steering itself, is it? The wave doesn't get, a go, get to go where it wants. It's being driven. And so many Christians, it's so sad, they are not being led by the Spirit. They are not walking in faith. Their lives are being driven by the pressures of life. They're being driven by, you know, it's just so sad. I th I'm thinking about several people. They're not spending their days pursuing the will of God. They're spending their days acquiring money to pay bills. And I just feel so sad because God has called us to a higher life than that. We need to work. We need to make money. But there's a will of God. I'm living for the will of God and expecting the money to come. And just because I'm a preacher doesn't mean you're not supposed to be living the same way. The will of God is going to involve a job for most of you. Amen. But when it's the will of God, you're not just living for money and a paycheck. There's an assignment with that. There's peace with it anyway. But see, people are being driven. They're being driven by pain. They're being driven by sickness. They're being driven in their life. They're not going where they want to go. They're going where depression is telling them to go. They're going where fear is pushing them to go. And think about this. Most of the time that's into a corner where you're paralyzed, not doing anything for God. Someone who's depressed and oppressed, where do those people like to hang out? I've been there, I know. In the bedroom with the shades drawn, with the covers up over their head. Drinking or putting something in them to try to numb it for a while. Listen, I'm not going to live my life like that. I'm going to live by faith, walk in the steps that God wants me to take instead of letting the winds of doubt and fear and worry and unbelief dry and tell me where I'm going to go in my life. And this is where men and women of faith have to buck up and be strong, like Brett was saying. I hope he didn't get confused by anything he said there. You know, about getting in there and fighting. Right? Yes. When it comes to the devil, you better fight. Yes. You better have an attitude That's right. Come on now. towards the devil. I'm not talking about people. Right. Amen. Amen. Let's keep reading here. So for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Now notice how the fairness of God. Look at verse 7. Let not that man, don't, don't think male or female, mankind, that person... Let not that person think that he or she shall receive anything of the Lord. Now see, he's already offered, he said, if you lack something, ask. But he said, ask in faith. But what happens, believer, if you and I, what happens if we waver? Are we going to receive anything from the Lord? No. 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 I've had somebody asking me, this precious person, how, how come the Lord won't heal me? I say, because you don't believe. I do believe if you believed, you'd be up. I'm not, trying to be, I'm not trying to be discompassionate with you, but don't tell me you believe. If you believe, you would not be sending me this email asking me why God won't heal you. Nobody in faith who has believed they've received their healing asks, why won't the Lord heal me? You, do you get that, friend? I'm not trying to be critical, but people must see. 
You can't ask that kind of question and say you're in faith at the same time. I'm being as fair and straight up as God is in His Word. Well, I mean, well, I'll die if He doesn't do it for me. I better not waver then. Better not doubt then. Better not, right? Amen. You better not yield to worry then. Better take it serious. Better actually listen to what Pastor said. The more desperate it is, the more vital these things become. And if you're smart, you practice on situations that are not desperate. So that you get gooder and gooder and gooder as you go along in this walk of faith. Are you with me? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we read that from the... Well, let's just keep reading. Verse number 8 says, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Brother Paul, could we have that in the Amplified Translation? Now, notice the word... We're talking about doubt right now in this section. Doubt. Notice James introduces this word to help us understand what doubt is. Notice he introduces the word double. Double. Uh, I believe the Greek word here is diablos. It's where we get the word diabolical. Doubt is evil. What is it? Well, double. Double what? Double-minded. To doubt is to abort your... It's, it's, to, it's to scream up to heaven, hey, cancel that. Cancel that. Cancel that order. Put that on hold. Put that on pause. I'm going to doubt a while. What doubt actually is, is you are now entertaining two thoughts. Double-minded. Double-minded. This is the person that's they have their devotional time and they get stirred up for a few minutes on the Word. They leave the Word and they begin in, that the pain in their body begins to just work on them. Or the devil, you know, he's meanie. You know, when uh, in a married situation, I've, I've found this to be very true, that let's say one spouse gets a diagnosis in their body, maybe it's pretty serious. The spouse is going to be, they're going to have a harder time with what? Not faith to be healed. Fear. Fear. The devil's going to do everything he can to cover that spouse up with fear. More than time, this is my experience, more, often the one actually facing the diagnosis doesn't deal with the fear as much. But those closest to them. Now there have been times like Dodie Osteen, she said, to receive my healing from stage 4 breast cancer, I'll just have to tell you, I spent a lot more time standing against fear than I did trying to receive my healing. Receiving my healing is easy. Standing against the fear is where the fight was. This is why guarding your mind, step number four, is so critical. Don't ever forget it. Peter should have guarded his mind. I will not look at the natural. I'm going to keep my, own, I'm going to keep my focus on what I heard Jesus said come. And I'm going to keep my eye on Him. As long as you do that, you're moving in the supernatural. But if you get diverted to the natural, to the adverse, you're going to be... Now he, see, at that moment when he saw the wind boisterous and became afraid, now he's entertaining a new thought. He's entertained a contrary thought into his mix, and he's counting that thought as legit. These are people who say they're in faith, but they have, all, they have plan B, C, D, E, F... You know, faith doesn't need a plan B. You know, all through this, I'll just tell you, I know we're running out of time, but all through this building process, I, I felt like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, what am I going to do if? What are we going to do if? I better have something in place if. And then the circumstances would change. The, the cost of the building more than double. And I thought, well, God, we've got to change now because the cost doubled. You know, God wasn't moved by the cost of the building, not one bit. He had one idea, one thought. He said, build the building. Yeah. Build the buildings. All he told me, build the building. He never gave me another thought. And when circumstances changed, he never changed with the circumstance. Uh -huh. I wanted to. I thought in my mind, oh my God, we're going to have to. Not God. Yeah. Listen, if you've if you got a plan B behind your faith, 
you're not in faith. Faith doesn't need a plan B. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. So here we see, for being as he is, a man of two minds. How did he get that way? Let's assume he started in faith. But he, he added a thought now. Now he's double-minded. Out of one side of his mouth, especially around his pastor or people of faith, they say, yeah, by his stripes I'm healed. But in the secret places of their home, they're full of fear. They're talking fear. They are negative to the hilt. And they're planning their funeral. You've left faith now, sweetie. And power to heal your body is not working as long as you're in that circumstance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Notice how the Amplified describes a double-minded man. They are hesitating. By his stripes, yeah, yeah, by his stripes, I'm healed. No. No. Hesitating. Dubious. I like this word. Irresolute. Meaning you are subject to changing your position. You know, some, someone who's resolute, I'm not changing. This is the way it is. This is what's happening. I'm, coming, I'm going to the other side of this. That bill will be paid. I have a supply. And yeah, but what about what if, what if, what if, what if, what if people ask you, what if, what if, you're not obligated to answer their what if question. You are not obligated to answer their what if question. Sometimes you better not. You're falling into a doubt trap. Notice a double-minded man is unstable, unreliable, and uncertain. You know, you're someone who's, uh, we've had people, praise God. God just led them that way. You're done taking that medication. What if someone came and said, well, are you sure you are? Are you sure? Are you sure you're ready? Are, are you sure that's not going to hurt you? And you go, well, you know, you're right. Maybe I ought to, well, you better start taking your medication again now. Because you're uncertain. You know, when people ask me, Pastor, I'm believing I'm healed and been meditating on the Word, um, but I wonder, I'm, I just want to ask you, should I have this procedure? You know what my answer is? You keep your appointment and have the procedure. Why? Because someone who's got faith not to have the procedure would yeah. never ask me the question. Right. So that'll help you. Save me some time, you some time. If you come... Asking me, should I have the procedure? Yes, twice, amen, get the best doctor you got because it's no sin in that either. If I needed to have procedure, I'd have one. I wouldn't feel bad about it. I don't care what you think about me and my big faith message. I don't care. God's going to lead me by the Holy Spirit in where I am, in what He knows I can handle, and where I've developed my measure of faith. And listen, you are not obligated to make medical choices of faith based on my level of faith. I'm not the one facing that. I'm not the one dealing with you are. And you are free. You understand me? You are free. This is where I really disagree with uh, John G. Lake. John G. Lake would just tell you, you're in sin if you take medication. No, it was just, he got way off extreme in that regard. Because people may not have developed their faith yet, right? And that medication would help them save their life. Don't you be condemned. I don't want to get any emails from you. I'm so sorry I had a procedure, Pastor. I get emails like that because I preach a faith message. I've had people in tears so sweet. Some of them in this room, so sweet. I come to the hospital to visit them and I come in and they start crying. I thought, well, maybe I'll leave. You were happier before I got here. <laughs> so precious. Don't, don't, hear me. don't hear me the wrong way. So precious. Pastor, I'm just so disappointed. I'm just so, I just don't know why I can't get my faith to work. And You shouldn't have to come down here. Oh, if I didn't have to come down here, why, why, why is, you, this justifies my existence as a pastor. I'm supposed to be here with you. Yeah. Bless God, and I said, stop crying. I'm here to lay my hands on you. God's going to heal you. And you know, I laid my hands on her. God healed her. Amen. People are so quick to condemn themselves. Yeah. Don't do that. Amen. Amen. Amen? Are you with me? Amen. Hallelujah. Let's, let's sign. Yeah, we're going to have to close. Let's go over to Proverbs 4, and let's read this passage. I wanted to get to step number five. We're just not going to make it. Hallelujah. But I tell you, we could spend three or four, five, six services talking about guarding your mind. 
Because this is where you're going to have to contend with demons. I've told this story before. It's a true story. About a mother who had already had children die. And she left my church. I don't think she was mad at me. I think she just got neglectful and just slipped out of church as a habit. Left the church. Was out of church for several years. And I had heard that another child of hers, a teenager, I think it was her last or maybe her youngest daughter at that time was a teenager, and she hung herself, committed suicide and died. And I don't know if I shed tears, but I felt like weeping when I heard that. And then all of a sudden I'm in the gym working out and I see her over there. We made eye contact, so I wanted to be friendly. And I walked over and I didn't bring anything up, but she did. And said, you know, I, I don't know if you heard, but my... My teenager committed suicide about, I don't know, eight, let's call it eight months, whatever. I said, I, I did. I'm so sorry to hear that. Listen, listen to what she said. She said, you know, I knew, I knew something was wrong with her. I knew she needed help, but I didn't know how to help her. I didn't know what to do. Now, I didn't say this to her, but I said to myself on the inside, you failed when you pulled her out of church. Because in my pulpit and in our youth group, we teach our young people that that's a spirit attacking their mind. They think it's them, but it's a spirit in that unseen realm. It's a, see, we're going to have to contend with demons and evil powers. Telling her all the time that she's nothing, that she's worthless, she'd be better off ending it. And she said, Mama said, I didn't know how to help her. I said, well, I, in my inside me, right? If you'd have kept her in church, you'd have heard that all she had to do was say, I recognize you, you spirit of suicide. In the name of Jesus, I bind you. Cease and desist in your maneuvers. And if she'd do that on her, as, long as, as often as she needed to, she'd lived in victory over that. How important is the local church? But she pulled it. And, you know, and I, didn't, I said this to myself. I wouldn't say it to her. But I said inside me, you're partly responsible. Because you pulled her out of a place where she could have heard what she needed to hear to overcome in that. And so many people, thoughts of all kinds come against them. Thoughts of filth, thoughts of, thoughts of failure. And they think, they don't, they don't believe in that realm, that unseen realm. And, but it's real, friends. I'm not trying to make you kooky or weird. We have total victory over every negative evil spirit in that realm in Jesus' name. But you're going to have to contend with them. Y'all hearing me? You ought to not, people say, Pastor, will you come and pray over my new home? No. Don't have time. You go in your home. You get out to olive oil. If you want to. If you need to. You don't need to oil. Just walk through now in the name of Jesus. I call this home blessed. I walked into that hotel room. I mean, we're talking about a nation that worships 300 million deities. False gods pay. I walk into that room, that hotel room. I said, now this is my house for the next four nights. And I take authority over every dark and evil power, every evil works ever been conducted in this room. You get out. This is mine. I plead the blood of Jesus. Let the peace of God fall on this place. Amen. Didn't have any trouble. I don't want to gross you out, and I don't want to take you out there too far into Twilight Zone, but I've had some real reports of precious teenage girls tell me, Pastor Chris, an entity keeps coming in my room at night. It's dark, and it tries to touch me in places I don't want them to be. I guess I did tell you anyway, but... <laughs> well, see, in that situation, we were able to take authority over that, and teach her how to do that. She never had that problem again. Yes. Parents with kids having nightmares. Listen, take authority over that. I don't know how I got off on this, but I mean, just take authority over that stuff. You don't need me to come. My authority in the name of Jesus is not any greater than your authority in the name of Jesus. Come on, isn't that good news? Praise God. I had to tell myself, friends, I mean, I had to, I tell you what, you talk about getting attacked in your mind. The devil covered me up with fear about going on this trip. Just covered me up. 
And it would have been very easy for me to take that constant sense of fear and dread as a check telling me not to go. Listen, but I've learned. I know when the Holy Spirit is checking me down. The devil doesn't have access to my insides. Here's where I look for a check. I never got that check in there. But I tell you, I had to deal with my thoughts. And I, I wasn't perfect in it. I was walking around with my phone. I could show you my phone. Walking around taking pictures of my family's photographs. I cried at the airport. I just covered up the fear. See, but, that the enemy didn't want me over there. He didn't want blind eyes to open and 20 plus people to get born again and 70 pastors to hear the message of the authority of the believer. But see, we overcame all that. I did because I'm not going to be driven like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind just because the devil wants to oppose me. I'm going to go where God tells me to go. Amen. Feel like preaching. I'm going to let you go home here. Proverbs 4, verse 20. We're still talking about step number four, which is what? Guard your mind. What's step three? Be positive in your thinking. I can't help thinking. Yes, you can. Stop that. Really, you want to leave the babyhood stage of Christianity, stop that whole excuse of I can't stop thinking about it. Yes, you can. No one's, no one's doing your thinking for you except you. Amen. Well, the devil. <laughs> the devil is fierce and as a legitimate enemy as he can be is defeated. When you recognize him and you do what Pastor Nancy said and you answer him. You recognize, you answer specifically. Tell that dude to go. He's, I'm in a land 300 million demons. I mean deities. But my, I had to tell myself, my authority doesn't diminish because I leave the borders of the United States. My authority goes with me in the name of My angels go with me. The power of God goes with me. It goes with you. Amen. All right, closing, I promise. Proverbs 4, verse 20. Now, if you're a lady, you ought to write in your Bible or think when you see these words, you put, my daughter. I always, you know, it says, my son, I'm not... I, I, you know, I, this is personal. My son, what's he say to do? <laughs> Attend to my words. Now see, we had, these people worked hard on those long flights. They were there to attend to the passenger. We hit the button, we say, hey, they're there. A cup of coffee. Whatever you need, they're attending. What are we supposed to be attending to? Not supposed to be attending to your symptoms. Not supposed to be attending to your checkbook. You're not supposed to be attending your emotions. Emotions are so overrated. But Pastor, you don't, you don't understand how I feel. I'm sure I don't, sweetie. But they don't matter to the faith equation unless you say they do. You can have them. We all do. But you better rule them. You better reign them. You better get, you better get in control of them. Or he's going to whip your brains. Up. He's going to beat you up. And you'll leave the faith arena and you'll abort your healing or your miracle, whatever it is going to be. And I'm sorry if that makes you... <laughs> well, get over it. I can hear Pastor Nancy from, from the West Coast right now. Stop your crying. Crying's not going to fix it. I mean, if crying was going to give you victory, you'd add victory, some of you. You'd fill the bottle. And listen, I understand crying. I'm a crier myself. But that's not faith. What did he say to attend to? Did he say to attend to some, any old random thought that flies through your head? Attend to the Word. This is how you guard your mind. You attend to the Word of God. Not some, just any word. The word you started out standing on. Right? You're not done with those scriptures. She wasn't done with Mark eleven twenty three. 23. 
Once she had that revelation of faith, no, she kept, kept meditating, kept holding to it. So he says, attend to my words. I've got a different translation here. <clears throat> Incline thine ear unto my sayings, or in, in other words, lend your ear to what the word says. I got a minute left. I'm going to use it. People have come to me and said, Pastor, agree with me. I have a doctor's appointment Thursday at 5. Believe with me that I'll get a good report. Well, you missed it. Why do you care what comes out of the doctor's mouth if you're not investing faith on what they say? People miss it. it the, all the doctor's going to give you is a snapshot of facts. Facts are not truth. You don't go to the doctor to hear truth. He's not there to tell you truth. And all that blood report is, is a snapshot of what was going on in your blood at that moment in time. That doesn't mean that's what's happening in your blood right now. If you're going to the doctor, hoping, believing, to get a good report, calling that faith, you've just missed it. Just tweak, just tweak yourself. You already, sweetie, you already have the best report there is to have. Isaiah 53 verse 1 says, Who hath believed our report? The written report. You can't get better report than by His stripes I am healed. Glory to God. You don't, that's the report you're holding to. And if you'll hold to the truth, the truth will change the facts. Amen. Don't go in and berate your doctor and say, I don't accept that. He's going to think you're kooky weird. I just said, well, thank you, there. thank you very much. Doing a good job. And I get down the hallway all by myself and say, now the truth says. See, faith is not denying the existence of, you hold up a CAT scan and there's the tumor. And you won't tell the doctor, no, that's not there. <laughs> that's, that's dumb, flaky stuff. That's not faith. That's Christian science. You understand? Faith is not denying that something's going on. Faith refuses its right to stay that way. It'll get out in the hallway and say, that, I, I strike the, the death blow has been struck to that tumor and it's dying sure enough. Are y'all here tonight? So he says, Let them not depart the words from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they, what's the they? The words. They are what? Life unto those who find them. And health, the margin of my Bible, the medicine, it's the Hebrew word for medicine. It is medicine to all our flesh. Last verse. Keep means guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow or spring forth the issues of life. Did you get that? Amen. Guard your mind. How do you do that? I mean build a big wall with the Word of God around it. That's all you see. That's all you hear. You're not focused on anything else. There is other stuff out there, right? There's the circumstance. But you're holding to your faith. You're holding to what you said you believed you received. And God is watching from heaven and He's so pleased. Your faith is giving substance to the thing you prayed for. And it'll spring forth on the scene. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, let's stand up on our feet tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.